good morning, Kingdom Chapel. It's uh, great to see you here back to our online service at KC. And so I just want to welcome you, take the time to welcome you, and I'm um, just so glad that you're with us this morning. You know, we're kicking off a, a new uh, series today entitled Glow. And we're going to be looking into the life of the church of Thessalonica. And man, there are so many just incredible things that we're going to be able to discover about these early believers in Jesus that that what they lived for, what they hoped in, how they loved one another and served one another and, and how they championed God's mission and embraced the gospel, how that has it changed how that changed their lives and also what it's going to do for us today in our own lives. And so uh, I don't know about you, but, um, you know, through this entire quarantine it has really um, helped me to lose the facade, to lose the, the surface level um, faith that maybe I have been living or, or putting on and really diving deeper into my understanding of Jesus and what he has done for me and who I am in him and all of these different things. And we see this from the church uh, in Thessalonica. You know, uh, maybe this time has brought you closer to the Lord. Maybe this time has brought you closer to, to Jesus as you have uh, truly uh, just devoted time and devotion to him and into the scriptures and clinging to his truth. And, and not only that, but clinging to your brothers and sisters in Christ and, and loving one another and seeing how much you miss one another and love one another and all of these things. Maybe that has been brought out of you. Or maybe, um, maybe there are some of you that have this time that has really served to do quite the opposite, that that rather it's, it's, it's made you grow more cold for the things of God and grown more apathetic to the things that, that we're called to as, as uh, people of God and, and uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ, not clinging to the church. You know, a lot, a lot of us have really allowed this busyness of our schedules, this change in our life, this interruption uh, in the world that is happening globally to consume us with fear, to consume us with busyness and running our minds rampant, going in many different directions and, and not honing in and leaning into God during this time, but rather we have allowed our busy schedules or our um, lack of of love for the Lord or his church really kind of creep in and create this apathetic um, love for God and, and for the things of God. And so if that's you or, 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 if, or if you have been truly encouraged through this quarantine and you have been clinging to God's truth and you have been growing and you've, you've allowed for this time to really show you some incredible things about not only yourself, but about God's word then I pray that this time just continues to stir you up, this sermon, this series uh, that we're going to be journeying into together, GLOW. And so have you ever realized and understood how God's Word is so relevant to us, especially through this time? I mean, uh, kind of what I was just talking about just a moment ago, that this this time, this quarantine has just really served in my own life to just reveal to me how much I need my brothers and sisters how much I need God's truth, how much I need to cling to the promises of God. You know, we as Christians, we don't live with the same perspective that the world has. We live with an understanding that we see a bigger picture in life, that we know the end of the story, that we have a great hope that we have a great promise, an inheritance that we are clinging to and living for. And that's what we're going to discover here in the book of 1 Thessalonians. And so I'm excited to go through this together. And so if you would, if you would take your Bible and, and turn over to 1 Thessalonians with me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 is where we're going to be. And we're going to be in verses 1 through 10. But before we do, you can find and discover Paul's, the Apostle Paul's, first encounter 
with the Thessalonians in the book of Acts in chapter 17. Chapter 16, he's in Philippi, and then he experiences, along with T- Timothy and Silas, this great persecution where they were stripped of their clothes for preaching the gospel and brought into the streets, and they were beaten with rods, and then they were thrown into prison. And then God is bigger than their persecutors. And so what happened was God sent an angel to unlock the prison doors so that they could be set free. And then they go over to some brothers and sisters there that they had seen come to faith in Jesus, namely Lydia, and they encourage, they encourage them. And then they depart from there. And then they go on to travel and they end up coming to Thessalonica. Thessalonica was a major city in that day and time, about population of about 200,000 people. So it would be considered to be maybe the New York or the Houston of their day, filled with a lot of darkness, filled with a lot of things that's going on, a lot of idolatry. Uh, there was, of course, a synagogue there. So there were Jews there and, and Greeks there. And Paul, whenever they enter into Thessalonica, Paul, in Acts 17, it says that he goes into the synagogue there, and for three Sabbaths, that's all we're told that that he had there. He could have been there longer, but we're told that for three Sabbaths, he reasoned from the Scriptures that Jesus was the Christ, and he and he just proclaimed the gospel. And the text tells us there in Acts 17 that, that some of the Jews believed him. They, they received the word that he was saying. And then many of the Greeks did. And then even some of the leading Greek women. And so um, God used Paul and Silas and Timothy there in Thessalonica, even for the short period of time that they were there, because even in Thessalonica, they would experience persecution. Even in Thessalonica, they would experience where people were enraged at what they were proclaiming. You know, we, we know that this is the truth for us as believers in Christ Jesus, that, that whenever the gospel message is proclaimed, <clears throat> there's going to be a couple things that are going to take place. First, people are going to get angry. People are going to get angry because the gospel is offensive. The gospel tells a person that they need Jesus Christ in their life and that apart from him, they have no hope. Why? Because they have been uh, entrapped in their own sin from the very beginning, like we talked about last week, that sin entered into the world through one man and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all have sin. That's Romans chapter 5. And we know that Adam and Eve brought sin into the world. And because of their disobedience to God, the entire world has been left in this crisis of sin. God sending his son in his love for us 2,000 years ago. The gospel message is that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. And what did Jesus do? He came to pay for our sin. He came to... uh, to offer himself up as a sacrifice for the atonement of our sin, to to pay in full what was owed to God, this penalty for breaking his law. And God, being a good and just and holy and righteous God, sent his Son in a love for us. And the Bible makes it very clear that the gospel is exclusive. And so whenever the, the gospel message is proclaimed, what happens is people get angry. They get angry because they don't like to hear that they're sinful. They don't like to hear that they need a savior. They don't like to hear those things. However, the gospel also is full of God's grace and mercy and compassion and kindness that God would send his son. I I often tell folks that there is no greater love story between God and man Think of it. History has not been able to come up with one, and neither can you, that God would send his very own son to die on a cross for us to stand in our place so that we could have life everlasting. And so when the gospel message is proclaimed, anger anger comes out of people. And along with that anger, persecution happens. Uh, They don't like that. And so there tends to be persecution that comes upon the believer in Christ Jesus. And that's what Paul and Silas and Timothy experienced in Philippi and throughout their missionary journey. And it was no different in coming to Thessalonica. So as they go in and they are reasoning from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ, the Jews get angry. 
and they drive them out of the city. However, many of the Greeks believed, some of the Jews believed, and many of the leading Greek women believed there. And so they hid Paul and Silas and Timothy under the cover of darkness, and they sent them on their way. But you know, a pastor's heart is for their flock. And so as Paul would move on and they would sail to Athens, Paul would get to Athens, and we'll discover this later on in 1 Thessalonians, that Paul was so concerned about the believers there in Thessalonica that he had to send Timothy back so that he could learn of their faith. And what, Pitt, what Timothy brings back to Paul encourages Paul's heart uh, as he learns that their faith has grown. You see, the Thessalonians were glowing. They were glowing in their love for what they had heard. This gospel message that God loved them, that God loved them so much that God would send Jesus Christ, his very own son, to die for them and to give them a hope and to give them a future to look forward to in the kingdom of God. And that's what we're going to discover this morning. So if you would, now that we have a little bit of an introduction into what we're going to be talking about, let's turn over to 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to look at chapter 1 together. So Paul begins in this way. He says in, in chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, grace to you and peace. You know, I've been saying this for a while now in our, our Facebook group on, online or even among us here at KC that, that before all of this spread is that we, our lives have been interrupted by God that we have been privileged to be a part of this incredible journey that God has put us on together. And here's the thing, in a world where there's chaos, in a world where there's confusion and uncertainty and fear and all of this pandemic and all of this stuff that's going on, Paul says right in the middle of that, he says to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you. And peace. You know, that's so important for us to understand because here's the reality. You see, in a world where there is chaos, in a world where there is fear, in a world where there is uncertainty, Paul is reminding, and he does this in each one of his letters, grace and peace. He starts that way and he ends that way. Grace and peace to you. That the most powerful being in the universe is in control. You don't have to worry. You don't have to fear. If you are in Christ Jesus, then you are as safe as you can ever be. Grace and peace to you. In the midst of persecution and trial and, and, and whatever we may face in life, circumstance after circumstance, God is with you. Don't worry. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, Paul was very adamant about reminding the different churches about this incredible truth that in Jesus Christ, they're safe. In Jesus Christ, no matter what they face in life, they can rest assured that the Father loves them, that he's with them, that he has not abandoned them. The worst thing that a believer in Christ can experience is death. And then when we close our eyes to this world, we wake up to Jesus. Man, what a, what a peaceful thought that that is. What an awesome thought that that is. And so I hope that that truly encourages you this morning. He goes on to say this in verse two, he says, we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father, your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. I've got to pause there and just, just talk about this for a moment. You know, Paul is, is so encouraged by the believers there at Thessalonica. We're going to see later that, that he's going to tell them that he couldn't stand it any longer, so he had to send Timothy to learn about their faith. And then Timothy comes back to Paul and, and gives them this good word of encouragement that, that the believers there are pursuing God, that they're loving the Lord, that they're loving one another. And so Paul is saying, yes, 
Praise God for that. Thank God for that. Our work was not in vain. We were there a short time. God used us, and the mission of God has continued to go forward. Paul says there in verse 2, we give thanks to God always for all of you. I love that. Church family, I hope you're paying attention to this, that you are giving thanks to God always for the brothers and the sisters in your life who are there to comfort you there, to comfort you, there to bring you encouragement, there to, to help you take up your cross and to follow after Jesus. He continues on to say, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. You know, how often are we taking uh, our brothers and sisters before God the Father? How often are we remembering them before our God? What He's done in their life thankful for them, praising God for them, and just encouraged by them. You know, church, we really need to grab hold of this truth. We need to, to harness this reality that, that we live life differently than the world, that we are a part of something incredible, that we're a part of the church of God, that we're a part of what Jesus has come and died for and shed his blood for, and that we are called into fellowship with one another, and that we are called to love and serve and think about and pray for and encourage and admonish and teach and, and help one another in Christ. And that is what Paul is so encouraged by here in the text as he is writing back, as he remembers the believers there at Thessalonica. He says this, remembering them before our God and Father, your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, though they were experiencing persecution, which we'll later see in 1 Thessalonians, the believers there, that they didn't lose heart, that they didn't, no matter what circumstances were brought their way, that they continued on in this labor of love, that they continued on in this work of faith, and that their hope was in a steadfast hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, they were living in light of the kingdom. They were living in light of the truth of the gospel that they have now clinged so richly to that God loves them and that God cared for them and that God brought them out of their idolatry, as we'll see, into the family of God. And they took that serious and they loved God for that. And so we are encouraged here in chapter one to mimic this, to make this our aim in life, that we should cling to this same truth, that God has rescued us, that God has changed us, that he's given us a hope and a future in his kingdom, that we have purpose beyond our circumstances, and that while in our circumstances, we have a great hope and we have a great purpose to live for. You know, I'm encouraged by the believers here in Thessalonica because they had a steadfast hope in their Lord Jesus. They had a steadfast hope in their Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. Listen to me. Steadfast, that word there, it's a naval term. It means to continue forward, to go. It means to not stop. They're moving forward in their faith in Christ. They're moving forward. They haven't allowed this time to just interrupt that. And church family, I want to encourage you not to allow this quarantine to interrupt your faith and your hope in Jesus Christ, but continue steadfast. Continue steadfast in Jesus. You have a great hope. Labor in love. What does that mean? It means to, to, to what Paul is saying. Remember, he's laboring in love. He's in this work of the faith, proclaiming the gospel, encouraging his brothers and sisters in Christ, enduring everything for the sake of the elect. We have the same responsibility and the same call on our own lives that we're to labor in love for one another. We're to work in faith for one another. We're to constantly remember one another and bringing up one another in our prayers and thanking God for one another and praying for their, their safety and their, and, their, and their being built up in Christ and, and their, their faith to be established in the Lord. You know, Paul truly, truly desired everywhere he went that for people to come to faith in Jesus 
and beyond that, that once they've come to faith in Christ, that they grew in their understanding of who Jesus Christ is, what Jesus has done for them, and this great hope that they now have. And that's what we're seeing here in in 1 Thessalonians, when he gives thanks to God always for all of them, constantly mentioning them in their prayers. He continues on to say in verse 4, he says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. You know, I love that. That's an incredible truth for us to cling to. I've always loved that verse there in 1 Thessalonians, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you. And Paul said that he would suffer anything for the sake of the elect, the sake of the chosen by God, those loved by God and called into the family of God. Brothers and sisters, we are loved by God. We are chosen by God. If we are in Christ, we are chosen by God and we are loved by God. Now he's going to go on and say why he's fully convinced of this. He says in verse five, he says, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You see, what Paul is saying is that is that he's so convinced that these are true, genuine brothers and sisters in Christ. Why? Because they have loved the gospel. They have clung to the gospel of God. That They get it. They understand that their life is so much more than this world. That God, literally the most powerful being in the universe, has interrupted their lives. And that with full conviction, when Paul came to preach the gospel message there, that they received it with power and with full conviction of the Holy Spirit. With much affliction, he's going to go on to say, he says in verse 5, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, you know, he says, what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul's saying, you know, guys, that we didn't come to you on our own, our own agenda. We didn't come to you with our own word that we wanted to say to you. This wasn't made up by us, but this came to you in power and with full conviction of the Holy Spirit. And you received it and you became imitators of us. You received our word. You received what we proclaim to you. This great hope, this gospel message that Jesus Christ came to die for sinners and to give them a hope and a future. And you embraced it and you loved it and you became an imitator of it. And you received it with much affliction. You know, we, we first receive the gospel with much affliction because remember, The gospel is offensive. It tells us that we need a rescue. We need a rescue from our sin. And that God wants to save us and that God made a plan and a way for us to be saved. And and that's through His Son, Jesus Christ, that He would send His very Son while yet we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible tells us, God didn't wait for us to try and clean ourselves up or even to come and ask him for help, but that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us so that we could have this incredible hope. It's no wonder why these believers there in Thessalonia loved God, loved the people, loved the gospel, cherished what God had said to them and what God brought to them through the apostle Paul and through Timothy and Silas. They had received it with much affliction. They knew in their hearts that they needed a savior, that they needed a rescue plan, that they needed someone to help them, to turn them from their wicked ways, to turn them from their evil, to turn them from their sinfulness, to give them an incredible hope. And they received what all true believers received. They received the Holy Spirit with joy. God loved them. And Paul reminds them of that. For this reason, brothers, we know that you are loved by God, chosen. Paul continues on here 
in verse 7. He says, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything my goodness, isn't that incredible? What Paul's saying is that, is, that, is that, guys, you, your faith in Christ has sounded forth everywhere. You've become an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia and the surrounding region that all of their eyes are on you. They're hearing of your faith. They're seeing what you're doing, that your lives have been transformed by the grace of God. And we didn't have to tell you anything. We didn't have to encourage you to do that. We didn't have to excite you, try to excite you to get excited about the things of God. My goodness, you guys just love the gospel. You love what God has done for you and you cherish it. That church is what every church should be. Every church should be full of brothers and sisters in Christ who love what God has done for them, who love this rescue plan that God sent his son on, giving them a hope and a future and a life, defeating sin in their lives, paying for it in full, literally standing in their place and willingly sacrificing himself on a cross. Every church should be filled to the brim with brothers and sisters in Christ who love Jesus in this way who love the gospel, who cherish what God has done for them, who love the brothers and sisters in Christ, who love one another and are clinging to this mission now that God has interrupted their lives and tasked them with and put them on this journey toward the kingdom of God. What an incredible hope. It's no wonder why Paul is constantly giving thanks to them, uh, to, to God for them, remembering them before the, the Father, bringing them up, constantly mentioning them in their prayers and, and, and all of these things. Why? Because it's encouraging Paul. It's encouraging him that his work was not in vain. It's encouraging him that the gospel is being proclaimed, that God's bringing purpose to Paul's life, that God is doing an incredible thing and that he is continuing to be faithful to his son Jesus for what his son Jesus did for those who would believe upon him. Man, what a powerful, powerful truth that that is. What a powerful truth that is. And Paul, he's going to continue on to say here in verse 8, for not only, we'll read it again, for not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything and then in verse 9, for they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. As I said, when I began, Thessalonica was a dark city full of idolatry. Many Greeks there a lot of different God, so-called gods, idols, all of that saturated the city. Great place to preach the gospel. So Paul goes in and he reasons from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Some Jews believe, many Greeks believe, and many of the leading Greek women believe. It tells us, it tells us in Acts 17. And what Paul is saying is that this is so incredible because I don't know about you. I, I've seen people worship and bow down to their idols in life, worshiping and following vain things, things that are never going to, to restore them, things that, are, that cannot answer back to them, things that have no ears, things that have no mouth, things that 
They cannot comfort them. That They cannot give them what only the true and living God can give to them. And so, brothers and sisters, what God is saying here through Paul as he's writing this is he's saying that, that they received them and that they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, the one who hears, the one who can answer prayers, the one who, who is in sovereign control over the entire world, the only God the true and living God. And I've seen men and women bring, I've been to temples where they would bring fruit and different things and lay them at the idols there in front of them and they would pray to these idols. And it's broke my heart because there's so much vanity there. So much vanity that these things, man-made things that they think that they're worshiping, that they're bowing down to, could help them in life. And the reality is, is they can do nothing. They can do nothing. Too many times we're bowing down to our, our things in life. You see, an idol is not only it's not only a, a statue or that is carved out of wood or, or precious metal or whatever the case may be that we, that, we, that we know of or think about as idols. Idols can be anything in our life. An idol is anything in your life that you place in front of Jesus that takes worship from your heart rather than the Lord Jesus Christ. Too many times brothers and sisters are giving themselves over to idols, giving themselves over to their things, their material possessions, their careers, their success, their children, their comforts in life. Paul is going to go on in the, in, the, in the letter to the Thessalonians to tell them that they were destined, that Paul and Silas and Timothy were destined for persecution. You know, we all experience persecution as followers of Jesus. And here's why. The very first type of persecution you experience is self-denial. Denying yourself and taking up your cross and follow Jesus. Removing the idols in your hearts and turning to serve the true and living God who loves you, who cares for you, who called you into his own glory and kingdom. And what a precious thing it is to know Jesus. What a precious thing it is to know Christ, our Savior. And that's what Paul is so encouraged by. Because these brothers and sisters, they're living this out. They're living out this real reality for those of us who are in Christ that we have this great hope. Paul said at the very beginning of the chapter that they had this steadfast hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on in verse 10 to say this, and to wait for his son, to wait for Jesus, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. What's incredible to me, looking back and reading the scriptures, is that even 2,000 years ago, the early believers lived in light of the kingdom, that they had their eyes set on the prize. They had their hopes set on Jesus, eagerly waiting for his return. And what did they do? They died. He didn't return in their life. They died. But they lived with this hope. They lived with this anticipation of Jesus' return. And here's what he realizes. The scriptures are written for us so that now 2,000 years ago, we might still live in light of the kingdom, that we might still live in light of our hope that we have in Jesus, in light of this great inheritance that God has given to each and every one of us who has believed upon Jesus Christ. Paul says, who are eagerly waiting for his return. 
eagerly waiting for his return. It means to go through this life with an understanding that this is not home. But to go through this life knowing that God has given you a great hope. That he's given you a great future in the kingdom of God. And and holding on to that and clinging to that with every ounce of your heart. I'm encouraged by this. Verse 10. Waiting for Jesus eagerly. And how does he finish? Verse 10. Who delivers us from the wrath to come. You know, we, we desire good things in life. We want life to go well for us. And we want life to go back to normal and all of these different things. And I do too. I do too. I can't wait till we can gather again, be among the brothers and sisters in Christ, truly loving one another and being in person with one another. Quite frankly, I am tired of speaking to a camera. However, we all must keep an understanding that this world is passing away, that this is not our home. This is not our future. This is not our hope. Our hope is in Jesus, and we eagerly wait for him. Why? Because he has delivered us from the wrath to come. Yes, God is bringing an end to this world. Whether it's soon or thousands of years down the road, who knows? But God is bringing an end to this world, and he will do as he said. The psalmist talks about it in in this way, in the prophets in the Old Testament, that God will eventually rise and he will terrify the earth with his judgment. That one day the skies are going to open up and Jesus, like a curtain, and Jesus is going to return and he's going to judge the world. And and, and in Matthew 24, we we see Jesus talk about these things and he's he's going to separate the goats from the sheep. And the goats will will be cast off into destruction, into hell, to pay for their sins because they rejected the lamb that was slain for them. They rejected the Christ. They rejected Jesus. And then those who belong to Christ, the sheep, they are going to inherit the kingdom of God forever and ever and ever, and it will never end. And they will live in total peace. And we will understand what true peace is and glory and living in light of um, God as God will be with us every day. And so brothers and sisters, I, I hope that this encourages you this morning. We cannot be faithless to the gospel We cannot be faithless to what God has done in our hearts, how he has changed us. We need to cling to one another. We need to love one another. We need to cherish the truth of God. Don't allow the busyness of your schedule to distract you from what God is wanting to teach you through this time, to to distract you from what God is wanting to do in and through your life and in your family's life. We'll discover that Paul was so concerned about the Thessalonians, he was afraid that the evil one, that Satan had hindered them because of the affliction and the persecution and all of this stuff, that what they saw, that that Paul and Silas and Timothy had experienced, that they would shrink back and that they would be hindered in their faith. It's no different today We have an enemy around us. The the devil is very real and at work in our lives and working and wants to distract us and wants us to be disconnected from their church, from, from God's truth, all of those things, and wants to bring in confusion and chaos and doubt and all sorts of things in our lives that's going to be hurtful to us and ultimately destructive to our faith. But we don't have to give in to that. Because 
we can cling to the promises of God and grab hold of the mission that just as the Thessalonians grabbed a hold of, they loved the Lord Jesus Christ and, and their steadfast hope in him. Here's, here's what I want to say to you. Jesus came and suffered on a cross to give you more. I heard this the other day, to give you more than a good sermon on a Sunday and a few good songs to sing. He came to restore your life back to God. That's every day. That's your life. Jesus is your life. So I pray that you'll cling to that truth. And I pray that you will glow in a love for our Savior and for our King. In what he's done for you. In what he has done for you. And that all of us, that our faith would sound from us everywhere. That people would see we're glowing, we're glowing for Christ. I want to pray for us, church family. And uh, Lord, I uh, just want to, to, to say that I love you guys. Before I pray that I love you guys, I truly cherish you. And I'm looking forward again to when we can gather together in purpose, in, 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 in purpose and um, in person. I'm tired of talking to a camera. I'm ready to give some hugs, to receive some hugs, to have some handshakes, and to see some smiling faces. And worship in this place, I cannot wait until again it's filled with God's praises, that we again are praising our Savior together. But here's the thing. We have purpose where we are now. You have purpose through this quarantine. You have purpose in your life. Harness what God has done for you. Lean into it. Live it out. Allow the scriptures to encourage you. They are so relative to your life. Don't put them on a back burner. God loves you and you are chosen by God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this incredible word today. Father, not that I've delivered any, anything incredible, but we have looked from your word. God, how awesome it is, how relative it is to our lives, how genuine and authentic it is that, that, it, that it has the power to produce out of us an incredible love for you. And helps us to fix our eyes on the hope that we have in Jesus. Father, my prayer is that we would continue to be a church that loves one another, that truly clings to one another, that we wouldn't think it's silly or awkward or odd or anything like that, but that we would take seriously what your word has to say, that we're to grow in a love for one another. And God, we have seen that. We have seen that. Father, I pray that we would see it all the more that our church would be filled to the brim with people that love the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved his appearing, and that are eagerly waiting for him because he delivered us from the wrath to come. Father, we love you. I praise you. And I thank you so much for your incredible truth. Father, be with our church family, our brothers and sisters who, who though we're scattered now, we're, we're not... We're not scattered in heart. We're, we're scattered in person. Father, we need to feel your peace during this time. We need to feel your comfort and your love. And we need to, to feel the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives. And, and we need to, to know that you're with us. And Father, I'm praying that for each and every one of us, many of us are going through difficult times. Some are going through difficult times with, with furloughs and, and job loss and, and uh, uh, lack of, of work and uh, maybe different needs being met. All of these different things, Father, this is a hard time for us. It's a difficult time. But Father, we know that we can shine bright. We can shine bright as we look forward to the kingdom to come. As we look forward to what Jesus purchased for us, which is his kingdom. Father, I pray that our hearts would be encouraged this morning. And God, that you would use what has been spoken today, Father, to bring glory and honor to your name. Father, we love you. 
And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, church family. We'll see you next week.